Father, this is um, you meeting with us through the word. And Jesus is the word made flesh who was glorified and then poured himself uh, out as the spirit of the Lord. Of course, he's in heaven. Don't get me wrong. But as the spirit of the Lord, he put himself inside of us. Jesus, uh, Paul said Christ lives in us. The word. The word lives in us. The Lord, word glorified lives in us. Father, that's what we want. This connection, this eye opening illumination. Father, the, the evil people of this world have uh, comically named themselves the Illuminati. When Father, you are the one who illuminates your children through the word, through the light of the world. Thank you. In Jesus name. Amen. So the body of Christ is not a bum. I think about bums, I think about me. When I used to sleep on my grandmother's couch during the day while y'all were all working. <laughs> That's a bum. Uh, so the, the body of Christ, Jesus, has a job. The church has a job. And the job is not to love people. Man. If I could tell you how many times um, somebody tried to, um, <clears throat> I say it like that. Let me give you my perspective looking at it, not the person who's coming at me. They could be all different intents and purposes for whatever reason. Forget their side and don't feel sorry for them. This is what I'm saying. In my life, I've seen people try to come and bring me the love doctrine. That ain't the doctrine. <laughs> the church's job is the gospel. Okay. And then the gospel includes the love of God and defines the love of God because love is not love. I don't care how many billboards you try to put it on. It don't matter. Love is not love. Only the gospel gives us for God so that's love. Everything else, you're copying. You're stealing God. You're perverting it. You're twisting it. God has the real deal, Bill. So the three levels to the gospel is what I was trying to get to. Um, I wasn't trying to um, tell you that we don't love. No, we do love, but we love like the gospel tells us to love. That's how you love. Love that'll cast a demon out of somebody. Love that'll take a slap to another cheek. You got four cheeks. Three levels to the gospel. First level is you get saved. You got to hear the gospel. The gospel is the English word for the Greek word euangelion, which is a word that they used back in the Roman Empire when they would go out and um, conquer new territories. They would uh, somebody would ride into the city. Uh, not the new territory, with message of the victory to the Roman people. And they'd ride through the city going, you Angelion, you Angelion. And, and the people would gather in the town square to hear the good news of the conquering, uh, the conquest. That's the gospel. That's what you heard when you got saved. The euangelion, the good news that Jesus has defeated the kingdom of all darkness and all sin in your life. That's what the euangelion, the good news is. We get saved. That's we come and we respond to the good news and get saved. That's level one. The gospel. It's the church's job. Get saved. It's not go love people. You are going to go love people. And you might not even like the love that you're going to have to love. <laughs> but um, so the level two, it would be uh, power. After you get saved, that's where everybody usually quits. But that's not what the gospel does. The gospel then takes the new saved people. And then like Jesus did when he rose from the dead, he blew into them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost. Now go wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. And then... And then you can go be my witnesses. He said, go out into all the world, but you're not allowed to go out into all the world 
until you receive the endowment of the power and the Holy Ghost. And then, only then. So imagine all the Christians that got saved and went whoop, right on to uh, everywhere but Jerusalem. Hey, wait before you got, can't be a witness like that. Boy, the world's going to be confused. Because <laughs> there's people out there that look wacko. Well, if we could all have the unity of the spirit, that'd be great. But uh, so if you were in maybe a full gospel place, they might show you that after salvation, you go to power and it's not a big deal. All the blow people make about it is nothing. It's just ordinary life. Your child can make a perfect, easy sense out of it. Power. Then the last one we've been looking at is, uh, see, and a lot of people stop there. In fact, a lot of the mainline, I guess all the Pentecostal spirit-filled believers, that's kind of where they stop. And they feel like that's it, like we are doing the full gospel. I don't think so. I think the Bible leads you to the next level, which is sonship. That's really, you cannot miss that part of the gospel. You have to uh, be sunized. He sent his son for that reason. To be the blueprint of you. You have to do that. You're not allowed just to get saved and beat your wife and do all this stuff and do all these weird things and then make people reject God because they're looking at you and you don't even, you're a witness to Jesus. You don't even have the spirit of God and you're walking around just claiming to be his child, reading the Bible, making people pray, beating your wife, cheating on your wife, doing drugs, doing horrible things and then people go, I ain't never going to church. I wish you would have went to a full gospel church where they wouldn't have let you just get saved. Because then you'd at least be all more in the unity of the spirit. Somebody getting saved without going to Jerusalem. That's ruined thing. Sonship. The power people, even if you went to the power, is you got to be as there's people. And I watch what happens. So then you, you take the people who don't go to power, you give them power. <laughs> So now they're just like doing power, living like. Because you go to the third step. Where you are being made all the time, your whole life. This is what your life is about. I don't know what your mom and dad told you, but they lied to you. This is what your father in heaven tells you. Your father in heaven tells you what's what's what. That's this is what life is. You becoming into the image of Jesus. The father wants his son in you to be sunized. You have to let that happen. You can't just be saved and you can't just have power and just cast demons out of people. Because you could do all that stuff and be rotten as an egg. Like, be a rotten egg. And we got egg people in the room, so what, what a, you know, what a random, or not so random. Today the gospel is just one-sided. Power has been replaced by God's sovereignty. Everything's God's will. This big tumor hanging off the side of my eyeballs, God's will. Like, why would you not pray for that? Uh, why would I resist God? He's humbling me. He's teaching me a lesson. I'm learning about life through this cancer on my face. Is this good? Okay. I feel like there was this one time. It was horrible. I mean, it was like, no. Am I making it up? Okay. I, no, I, no, it wouldn't, no, it wouldn't be you. Power is replaced with suffering. People suffer for God kind of witnesses you 
You win that lottery, buy that building, then whatever God has that he hadn't unveiled to you yet about whatever that is. Because um, faith, you know, in the headlights, you're just supposed to get the place. It's going to turn. What if it this is pretend it just turned into this big mega end of your life thing? That'd be a witness. You dying and nobody know you die and you're just sitting out there in that in that place for 10 days and 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 we all just come around and cry about we we should have loved you more and 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 did more for your birthday and you, what kind of witness is that and that ain't, and nobody else saw you and that ain't going to be your witness Man, y'all going to have to decide right now if I'm possessed or not. I don't care. I just came right, it just came right out of my body. Either that's this or it's not this. And y'all are crazy. Whatever, man. Whatever, man, I don't care. I know my journey. I remember asking God to be baptized with the Holy Ghost on that couch I used to be a bum on. All right then. I ain't scared to be embarrassed. Man, it better be like this. Man, there's no way we're going to make it if it's just us in this room with our human intellect trying to make it. Maybe somebody, maybe somebody who dedicates their life so God can do this. Uh, sonship has been replaced with the Old Testament doctrine. So we become these, the Old Testament was written to people who did not have God living inside of them. So sonship today, instead of us becoming sons, here's what we do. You go to church and they preach to you constantly out of the Old Testament. Dead people, that the Torah was to those dead people. We have been born again alive to God. And, they, and you come to church and they pour water all over you by, by religious Old Testament doctrine. The Ten Commandments. Oh boy, they're hanging them up now in whatever state that is. Boy, I just want to shout, but I can't. The Bible clearly says if you hang the Ten Commandments, they will cause sin. That was what they were designed to do so that you would realize there's an impossible keeping these laws. There must be another way. I cry out for I need a savior. The law was my schoolmaster to lead me to call on the name of the Lord Jesus. I can't do the law. Why are you teaching me that? It's at, at, at my alive to God meeting. Power. Replace sonship, replace the Old Testament, you know, obedience. Because, you know, obedience comes from your faith. So that's what you hear over and over. Here's how you live for God. You've got to cut your hair. you got to do all these things because we're just Old Testament thinking and everything's just so religious and blah, blah, blah. And blah, blah, blah. We're just ruining God's witness. Everything we do would say. It's what they believe, see. And so, and then, so you hear that, you hear that, and then that faith produces obedience like Cain. Useless. means nothing. You're bringing stuff to the altar that God doesn't want. But that was your faith, though. That's what you thought. So we've been looking at sonship, I guess, the last week or so by learning that... Um, uh, we, we, we were giving, God, but given by God, the only creation, given a spirit inside of us so that as you go to the final purpose of this, so that we could receive God. He's a spirit. 
We, God wanted us to not just have this angelic relationship with him. There was this other kind of relationship. <laughs> Somebody's got that one. And I'm Iosa. Not that one. And I'm Iosa. Not that one. Who's got it? It's just an interpretation. It's not a translation. Anybody feel anything in their body? What, what was this said? Hey, Dad, we make room for you here. I'm going to buy him a lottery ticket, you know. So, um, what was I saying? 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 Anybody, what was I saying? Okay. We were looking at sunshine. Oh, the Eruayos. <laughs> Uh, we, we were the only creation given a spirit because God wanted us to receive him inside of us as our life. Even though we're already alive. That's what makes us, that's what makes us special. We've been learning that um, what are the things that we can do to stir our spirit? Like if God if we read in the Bible all these promises, he put everything in our spirit. He said all things. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And then so it's spiritual blessings in our, in our spirit and the Holy Spirit's in there. And rivers of living water, he called it. How do we access this? If there's got to be. You can't just tell me about that and expect me to sing a song about it. I mean, they are and they are, but I'm not. Dad. I mean, Father God. In front of these people. I want to know what you just said. How do I get to that? How do I stir that up? That's what we've been talking about. And we've been learning. It's kind of interesting how you can do these um, things to stir it up. And if you could stir it up, then you would just, it would just come out into your vessel. Like food comes into your vessel. And that would be the life force source. Anybody want to keep going down that road? Just a little bit. I'll take no no's. That's fine. Well, I got one person who already give up on me. Well, but that's okay. We just pray that it just gets in the pores of her skin without her permission. So, um, everything's in my spirit. I want to know how to stir it. So at the end of last week, I had a horror story that was told to me. It was like the, it was the worst story ever. It was, it was a horror story. It, it was. It, it, I had somebody tell me about looking at the cross, because that's what we've been preaching. We were talking about Cain and Abel and how you look at God through the sacrifice, and so it's Jesus, and you have to look at God through the cross. And so you know, I'm going on. I'm preaching that, and so this person comes up and they said, "Man, I did what you said." I, I don't, I'm looking at the cross, and I don't know exactly what I'm looking at, but I'm just looking at it, and I'm, you know, I'm going out the door, and I say, God, I'm looking at the cross, you know, I don't know if the person said, I don't know exactly what I'm looking at, but that's what they told me, and so they're looking at the cross, and I'm just standing there horrified, like, that's where I left him, what kind of teacher is that, like, this person was so hungry that they literally took just the uneducated and took just what it was and just started just putting it and just going to, you know, out the door. I'm looking at the cross. Heard the sermon on Sunday, doing it that week. I'm heard the, looking at the cross, looking at the cross. You know, I'm doing what the dude said. And the person gets uh, to the store, play, prays for their first rando. Rando. It's the kid's version of a random person. 
was the cashier complaining about you know pains and body or whatever and, and and then the person realizes wow there's a moment created for me to do this thing that I've never done before and I don't would never don't really want to do this and I'm going to do it because she stirred the spirit up that uneducated didn't even know what I'm doing but I did it because that's what I heard in the word and and just that we just a little right that's what happened that's proof even though it was a horror story to me. I was like, oh my God, I got to go back and fix that. <laughs> I'm looking at the cross. I don't know what I'm looking at, but I'm doing what you said. I'm looking at the cross. Okay, don't move. Let's go from there and put some feet on it. <laughs> um, it reminds me of how Adamush, that stir, that little, just looking at the cross, uh, that little stir that happened in that in that moment reminded me when I started listening to this guy named Curry Blake. Um, I think it was 2016, and I listened to every single thing he had. Every just I, every seminar, everything, all the books, all the teachings. Everything. So when I was when when because God put that teacher in my life. So I just eat everything, they, all the teachers, and I move on to the next one when they're all bones. And so um, I, I, I paused it the moment I heard what he was saying. I was listening. I don't even know what point it was in all that listening, but there was a moment I just paused, paused it, and I grabbed this little three-by-five card, and I drew exactly what I heard him say. And, there, and I, I drew this little stick figure, and he was holding a cross, and then I drew this, like, little... Um, uh, it would have been like this energy looking stuff on the cross. You know, he's holding the cross and the cross is emitting this bluish, you know, just glow or whatever. And then so he walks up to this person and he and he uh, says, let me give you this. I don't need your faith. <laughs> you know, what I mean, like, however it was, it was this picture. It reminded me of that, like imparting the life of the cross to a person. Even if they don't have faith, doesn't even matter. I'm walking around with this cross and the finished work and the life that's just, I'm talking about laser beaming off of this cross that I got in my, just the finished work. And I'm just going by and just imparting it to you and you and you and I'm imparting it to you and I'm, and this is the ministry, you know. And then I, and then after I drew that, I put it on my office wall and it stayed there until I thought I was going to find it and hold it up for you today. I don't know where it is. So, um, just that one little, I'm looking at the cross. Oh my God, I had to pray for the cashier. Great. You know, just like, I mean, it was a great thing. It was a new rando, you know, you, 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 it's in, you're just checking out like you've done a billion, jillion times in your life and then, Okay. I just want to uh, listen to this mystical truth right here. People who have already been born again, we're learning that the action of calling on the name of the Lord, Lord Jesus, oh Jesus, be one with me in this. You know, whatever it is, you're just right in that moment. Um, you know, we, I think last week we used the temper as, a, as an example. If you were going to lose your temper, um, how you would do it would be you wouldn't make your mind up. I'm not going to lose my temper because then you're using your uh, self power, life source and you make your mind up and you're definitely going to fail. But if you if you don't do that and you just about to lose your temper and you say, Lord Jesus, be one with me in this. And you just call on him to be one with you in this moment. You're calling on the name of the Lord. We're learning that that's a stirring of the spirit. You in your day, you could just be living life down here on the earth. And then if you just call on the name of the Lord right there in that moment, you're stirring, you're, you're making this spiritual stir 
And it may not mean nothing to you. That might mean, oh, well, you're stirring the thing inside of you that contains everything. What a simple action that we'd never do. Our spouses and kids should overhear us just calling out to Jesus. It's a spiritual stir. That's one thing. Then we follow that all the way till you even cry out, Abba, Father. So now, even if you get, uh, you know, to a place where you cry out, Abba, Father. That's the same thing. So if it, let's say I'm, I'm in my day. And I say, you know, hey, dad, help me with this. You know, boom, right there in that moment, even though that looks like it's this, this little prayer thing, it's this actual thing that stirs the spirit. I'm doing a spiritual thing in this spontaneous oneness of calling on the Lord, calling on my dad, calling on the father in this. Like I can do a physical thing. That's a mystical truth that people who are born again, we can do these certain things and stir up our spirits. Calling on the name of the Lord, calling for God to be one with us is a physical stirring of your spirit. Look at Matthew 9, 27. I'm not sure how far I want to read in this. But I want to show you that the Bible teaches you that God works from the inside. Man works from the outside. God works from the inside. Whenever you read. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. Stop right there. If they would have went to a doctor, you know, you've been going to some eye doctors. They didn't start with your inside. <laughs> Man starts with the outside. Let's say a blind man goes to a doctor and he sits down or he's asking Jesus and he says, hey, you know, um, uh, I want to not be blind. Um, Jesus starts right in the middle and says, well, do you believe I can do this? Wait, what? You're not going to get out your medicine bag. You're not going to. Where's the salve? Where's the surgical kit? Where's the. That's what man does. And so. God works from the inside out. If you believe in your heart. So believe that I am able. Isn't that interesting? That's a stir. For us in our gospel where we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When we believe, it starts in our insides. Whenever we go to face anything, we believe first in our insides, stirring up our spirit, because that's where everything comes from. Can you, do you have to live out here in the world where there's doctors and they put things on your outside and you deal with the outside? Yes, yes, you have to. But you, but you have to incorporate this as your foundation to live life. You can't live life and then put God on the top as icing. That would be the devil's greatest wish. What girl? That's exactly what people do. They live life and put God on top. Huh. Just came right out. Well, I don't want to be guilty of that, Dad, before I look at other people. Um, look at this. God works through the inner man, strengthening and imparting his divine life into your vessel. That's the mystery in the gospel. Not everybody who walked in, uh, lived, recorded in this Bible had that faith. There was only a special uh, niche of people who have the faith that I just told you about that has the indwelling God inside of them, and that's their faith. Old Testament, their faith was, I got to go to God. I got to go to the temple where his presence is. I got to go to the priest. I got to go. 
So God works by imparting into your vessel from the inside life in your inner man. I'm going to read something. Let me give you another example of a stir. Stir. Give me Isaiah 26, 3. An example of a stir. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Look at that. What peace is that? I wonder if Jesus went to Walmart and bought some peace. Here, I got your peace. Keeping your mind on me. No, your mind. There's another stir. Think about that. What if during your day you took your mind, right, and you harnessed it like a wild horse and you demanded that it submit, that you just put it towards God. I am not going to think about this surgery. I'm going to think about God. I'm going to think about God, his faithfulness. I'm going to think about how, you know, just what, all the things that should start coming out of your body the moment that you start thinking about God. Start minding God. That's a spiritual stir. You can start minding God and all of a sudden God will keep you in perfect peace. Now all of a sudden you've stirred something to wear peace. But not worldly peace. That's an example of a stir. Give me 2 Peter 3, 1 as a, a follow-up to this scripture. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. That's Peter, the apostle Peter. Look at what he was doing. He was telling his congregants that uh, he was going to stir up their pure minds by way of remembrance. So you want to keep your mind on the Lord. You said, he who keeps his mind on me. So how's a way right here is to stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. So start remembering things. Some of the favorite, greatest things you can remember about God, start remembering his faithfulness. God, I, okay, so you're waking up during the day and your mind was all about the surgery or whatever, but then you just start, you're practicing the Bible, you're like doing these things that are stirring your spirit where all things are. Here's the thing you can do. Start using your mind for that perfect peace by remembering the cross, his sacrifice, his provision, how he wants good things for me, how um, his plans for me are good. How, you just, you're, you're remembering and you're stirring up your mind. And then all of a sudden, you've just stirred your spirit. That's a cool example. What if we practice the Bible instead of just, like a lot of people don't even get to hear what we just heard. Hmm. So I guess that'd be hard for them to be guilty of hearing it and not doing it. Hmm. I guess that's your privilege. But second, second Timothy 1, 6 and 7 gives us an example in the Bible of stirring up something inside of you. Therefore, I remind you to stir up. This is Paul up, to Timothy. To stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So, uh, what is the gift? Everybody wanted to know, you know. It's only one gift. It's the gift of the Holy Ghost. You stir him up. He's inside of you. He's the Spirit of the Lord inside of you. The Spirit of the Lord is uh, uh, the Lord Jesus. The sonship model. Stir it up. Stir, stir up the gift that's inside of you. Here's what I want you to do, Timothy. I don't want you out there just doing Life. I need you stirring up the thing that's inside of you, the gift that, I, that came through laying on hands. If you put all that together, that's the Holy Ghost. If you have the Holy Ghost, you have every gift. Just so you know, girls. And if you got saved, you got the Holy Ghost. You should go get the power. Anyway, uh, let me... Uh, finish this. So um, you're stirring up what's inside of you, which is the Holy Spirit, which is God inside of you. Now watch this. That is the faith that you have to have to be a son of God for sonship. It's a mystery faith. It's not King David's faith. Um, it won't be people in the book of Revelation's faith after the church is gone. 
it, it's only for us. This particular faith is given to us. Um, I guess if you went back to six for me, Second Timothy. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. What if I did, I'm doing that to you right now? I'm, I'm, I'm reminding you to stir it up this in you. And you're like, man, you, you're the hundredth person who told me that this week. I'm so sick of hearing that. So how many people did you <laughs> tell you that? The Bible tells you that every day if you pick it up and read it. Stir up the gift inside of you, guys. This is our Christianity. This is the faith that you have to have that Abel had. It's the faith that brings the zap, the lightning. Okay. Give me Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you both mm. to will and to do for his good pleasure. I love making stuff up. <laughs> for it is God which worketh in you both man you want to shout man, we are, some churches shout I like that too below group they're pretty shouty <laughs> I'm a, this is where you would shout at the word both you know girls what's my favorite word I can't believe it's working right here in the Bible because um, they always go, Daddy, do you want this or this? And I just say, give me both of them. Or, Daddy, should I get this one or that? Get both of them. That's, sorry. The, uh, but right here, both, here's the both the things God's doing. He's put the will inside of you. Uh, I ain't finna love that cat. Mm -mm. How are you going to get past that? Well, God can get past that. He'll put himself inside of you and he'll work himself in there and will that. And before you know it, your will will be lined up with his will. Because he's working on me from the inside. Working on me to love somebody. Whoop, watch this. To will and to do his good pleasure. I'm glad that's not the Ten Commandments. His, his pleasure goes way past the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments would only keep you just a certain kind of robot. You know, like, oh, your robot performs the Ten Commandments. You would be a junky piece of junk if you perform God's good pleasure. Whoa, now. Hold on. That, he, everything just so perfect. Pleasing. God does that in you. He wants you to please him and then tells you, I'll do it. You let me do it. So our Christianity, our faith, should always be in the mystery faith where we're learning how to access the deposit inside of us so we can become these worker beasts who look like Jesus. Doing God's good pleasure as he wills to do all through me. When people are like, man, I remember you, Brian, from high school. How in the world? That is, man. You got the same problem as I got. <laughs> so, um, I want to just give you this new stir. And then I got one last thing and then I'm done. But I'm going to give you this new stir, please, in Romans uh, 10. So we talked about calling on the name of the Lord and leading it to calling on Abba. We'll talk about this one. You can do. My sweet baby. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth cool. confession is made unto salvation. Man, with the heart you believe, you know what, you know where your spirit, you know where your spirit is? Proverbs tells you it's in the middle of your heart. It's the innermost being of yourself. I mean, it's in your belly, but, but, but your spirit is, is mentioned to be in your heart. And so this is where the faith 
that Jesus was asking the blind man for to come from. And um, this is where you can, even as a born again believer, believe in your heart. Believe in your heart unto righteousness. What is that righteousness? That righteousness is everything that God has given you. You can't get into heaven with your righteousness. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Jesus has to give you his perfect righteousness where he kept the Ten Commandments in order for you to get in heaven. So it's you, it's you being able to believe in your heart to connect you to the thing that got his righteousness, which is all things. Believing in your heart. So as a Christian... The first thing you should be worried about is the mystery faith where I need to start believing these things in my heart and just start living life, believing these things in my heart. And then you'll be stirring your spirit, confessing them with your mouth. Watch this. It's such a stir. It causes you to get saved. So as a Christian believer, here's what I'm trying to get us to do a little more is to start stirring our spirit where the superness, uh, powerness of God can then get into our vessels and our minds and our lives and into our um, realm. Yes. But if you go off and practice any other kind of Christianity, you, you're like Cain. His faith is causing him to practice this kind of thing that God doesn't care about. Listen to Abel's faith. It's mystery gospel faith where Paul the Apostle has uh, been uh, chosen by God to write 14 books of the Bible, the New Testament, and it's relayed to him. He said, the gospel that I preach was not given to me by man, nor was it uh, taught to me by man, but by direct revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came down from heaven seven years after he went up after his crucifixion, he came back down seven years, met Paul the Apostle on Damascus Road and gave him a gospel to give to the Gentiles. Because Peter didn't get it. He didn't give it to Peter. Peter was called for a specific group and he tells you in his book, I, he, wrote, he wrote his letter, it says, to the scattered Jews in the diaspora. Peter was a shepherd to the Jewish nation. He did the kingdom doctrine that Jesus had on the earth. And then when Jesus left, King uh, Peter and, and the apostles started the church, the new church. It was going in Jerusalem and uh, it was seven years till Stephen came. And they, you know, they said, oh, we're not going to wait on tables. And they appointed Stephen and Stephen was stoned. And it's right there we meet the apostle Paul. Seven years later, when they're stoning Stephen, God, here's what he does. He let the Jerusalem people have the book of Revelation time. Isn't that interesting? The same time that's in the book of Revelation is given after the uh, crucifixion till the time Jesus comes back down. So it's almost like at the end of the time, if it was the book of Revelation, it would be the end of the book of Revelation. But instead, Jesus comes down from heaven and meets the Apostle Paul and says, I'm going to give you a gospel and I want you to go have everybody believe this. Oh. So that's why when Peter and Paul met each other, they got it. He said, I rebuke Peter to his face. And when they finally met in Jerusalem, they said they shook each other's hand and said, Peter said, I'm going to go where Jesus sent me to the Jews. And Paul, you go to where I'm sending you to the Gentiles. And that was all the pagans. That's us. We're the pagans. Jesus sent Paul to knock on our door. Here's what I want you to believe. I want you to believe that God lives inside of you and I need you to start drawing from this well inside of you. And people are like, well, have you heard about those Jewish apostles? Well, they say all I have to do is just like be circumcised and follow the law and do these like ritual things. And, and, and so, Paul, they, they told me that you really nobody. They're somebody. They drive like Bentleys and stuff. They look, you just look like nothing. Like you beat up, you got like rock, you know, still in your face. These guys rolling around in a new jet. Teaching me how to believe God. 
showing me how to be obedient. I'll give God my best. And you're going to turn out rottener than an egg. This new stir about con believing in your heart, this is something we should just add to calling on the name of the Lord and just believing in our heart. I would just say, God, I'm believing in my heart right now and then just name something. Be random. Say it out loud. Just practice the Bible. You're doing everything else. This mystery faith is the only way to stir up the goodies. Cain tried to stir up the goodies and he couldn't. It's his faith that was the problem. It was his faith that was the problem. It was his faith that was the problem. He didn't believe what God said. And what God has said to us is that we have to start drawing from the deposit inside of us. And if you don't believe that, if you have some other way to meet God, then you're Cain. So what we're trying to do right now is learn how do we stir up the spirit? I hear you telling me these great things and you want me to draw from inside of me. How? Let's end the sermon um, by learning these. Well, well, let's just add this new one to us. You don't have to learn every single thing in the Bible to start doing it. Start doing this right here. You'll be light years ahead of regular church folk. Supernatural stuff. Your life will look different. I wish we could have two exact farms right next to each other and somebody who was practicing the Bible and somebody who just practiced Cain's religion. G had a Bible, um, did the same, uh, you know, whatever, and looked the same. They looked, you know, all, everything looked the same. But God sees difference in faith, in what you believe, not what... How do we do this, God? I don't want to just like learn what's right and wrong. Like, how do I actually do the thing? Stir up my spirit inside of me. I don't want to be a cain. I don't want to waste my time with religion. I don't want to waste my time doing stuff that's not going to work. I, I need to be a son of God. I need, I have, I'm on an assignment. I, I have to be made right and perfect. I have to be a servant of your holiness. And I can't be a servant of your holiness unless you do something inside of me to will and to do that. So I call on you right now, right now. I just thank you. Remember that you uh, will make me holy because you gave me the Holy Spirit to make me holy. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end the sermon talking about how um, our mystery faith that we have to stir up the goodies um, is not found in the Old Testament. But I was using Cain and Abel because the Old Testament has the shadows, the Bible says. The shadows. What's a, what's a shadow? So, so, so there's shadows in the Old Testament of what the object is in the New Testament. So a shadow is the idea of what something looks like without revealing the something, the object. It gives, it gives almost evidence that something is casting it. But it's just a shadow. You don't go hug somebody's shadow or, oh, look at your car's shadow. That's a great, you know, car shadow. Or you might. I don't know. But um, in, in the Old Testament, Abel, we were using with Cain to see a shadow of faith. Hebrews would tell us that Abel's faith made the difference. It was Abel believing that what God demanded from him, Abel believed that what God demanded from him was the sacrifice, the innocent blood of an animal. He believed that and his faith caused him to give God that. And God said, according to your faith, not get, watch that, 
OK, so then Cain, he believed something different. God demanded the same thing that Cain had to give him. But he did. He believed that God would accept something else. That was his faith. He just he came to God. He went to church. He built the altar. He sweated. He did the whole thing. He just believed something different. He just believed that God would take this. Of course, he would take this. I mean. My grandmother's doing that. She, these people can't be wrong. Cain is a picture of not the world. It's just pe people that belong to God coming to him. Cain believed that God was a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. He believed that. But his faith didn't allow him to do the first part, which was God said, those who come unto me must believe that I am. He didn't, he didn't even make it. He didn't get to come unto God because he wouldn't even offer to God. But what, what is God demanding from you? He's demanding that the thing he put inside of you, stir it up and let it out. That's what he's demanding from you. He wants that from you. God is standing there like this. This is what I want from you, Cain and Abel's. I am demanding this thing from you. It's the deposit that I put inside of you. And I want you to give it back to me. That's what I want. This is your faith. I want you to hear this faith. And I want you to do this faith. And any other faith is Cain's faith. So the object of a shadow happens to be in the New Testament a person. Everything in the Old Testament that's a shadow happens to be a shadow made by a person. Hmm, that's fine. So um, the object for the shadows. Let's look at some of these. Look at Hebrews 10, verse 1 and verse 7. This is my last point I want to make, these shadows. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. Stop. Here's a Cain and Abel picture, right? So the Hebrews is Paul writing to the who? Hebrews. Okay. So these are the people, these are the Jerusalem, these are Peter's flock. Listen, we're all one flock. I'm not, I'm, I'm saying it a special way on purpose. I want you to see Paul's uniqueness that the Peter was given an assignment and the Jewish people in the seventh year by stoning Stephen was the rejection of Peter's ministry. And right there, when the Jews rejected uh, the Holy Ghost being sent through the apostles to them, God, instead of we would have been like, what's about to happen? They literally just said no to their risen Messiah. Now the world's going to end. God out of nowhere did something no one ever saw. No prophet in the Bible. It's called a mystery. God did something that everybody was like, wait a second, what did he just do? He just came down from heaven and he told the apostle Paul, the apostle Paul, I mean, I mean, Saul, his name was Saul. He was an evil man. Tell him here, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles and I want you to tell them this gospel. See how important that is in the Bible? What if you didn't know that? What if no one ever preached to you, Paul? Oh, <gasps> you'd be offering up those sacrifices that don't matter right there. That'd be like Cain offering up sacrifices that don't matter because the Hebrews, what they did was the Hebrews went back sacrificing in the temple as their means of relationship with God. He's writing to the Hebrews and he's telling them like you can't go back to shadows. The object came here. It like you the Hebrews that were turning around. This was the Peter's rejection. This is what caused God to start this mystery time. And then mystery time is going to end. Paul said, I, I'd show you the end of the mystery is when Jesus comes down and pulls us up to the clouds. But the world's going to keep going and finish the book of Revelation. And that's prophecy. So the Old Testament is prophecy. That's God revealing, revealing what he's doing, revealing, revealing all the prophets, revealing, revealing, revealing. And then he revealed all the way up to when uh, the Israel rejected Peter's risen Messiah ministry. 
boom. Something brand new, a mystery. No one ever heard of it. That's where you live. You got to hear this mystery faith. Jesus came down to say, here's y'all's mystery faith and I'm going to get y'all out of here one day and then we'll, I'll continue on with these, uh, with Israel and I'll end it where my kingdom comes down with them. But mystery faith, my God, people, why didn't somebody slap me as a child and beat me up and force me to do this? Hold food away from me, starve me, beat me, and say, you're going to learn this, young man, or you're not going to make it in life. No, it's here, let's get them the greatest education and blah, blah, blah. No. This. Okay. Uh, did you read verse 7? You did? Did not. Okay, let me have it. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Jesus said, The whole book is written about the object of the shadows is a person. Jesus is the substance. He's the reality of the shadows. That's what I want you to see. Let me have John 145. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Look at that. It's all about Jesus. Keep going. If you, oh, uh, go ahead and give me, you, you look at um, Luke 24, 27. I'm going to read John 5, 39. Search the scriptures, Jesus said, for in them you think you have eternal life. That's Cain. They, they're going to church. They're just living the Torah. They think they got the eternal life. Look, we're doing all this stuff. He, and, 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 and Jesus is saying, you, you think you have eternal life through the word, but they speak of me personally. And you won't come to me, the next verse says. And you won't come to me. It's almost like telling the church today, like, y'all won't come. You won't come to me to let me solve all your problems. Y'all won't come to me. You think you have eternal life. You just walk around and just think you're there at the word and dancing around the word and doing all these things, these religious looking things, but they don't matter. I need you to come to me. The whole point of the Bible is to come to Jesus and receive him as your life. Communion is a beautiful picture of that. And I love the people that make a huge big deal out of the communion. Because that's the, that's the picture. That's the picture. Him, you already alive. That's the tree of life. You're eating it. Into your body. Into my body. Inside me. I'm, I'm in taking God. I need to receive God's life into me. Because he's asking for it out of me. I ain't loving that kid. <laughs> but he put something inside of me that will. And I have to let that happen. And that's my secret sauce. I wasn't that great. I've let God do so many things to me. Huh? Listen, I, so, I, so I could be an example. Paul said he, he was the chiefest among sinners. I, I feel like I could, you know, say, man, God really saved me a long way so I could be a good example. Paul said to Timothy, so that in me first might be, Paul said this about himself. Paul said to Timothy, so that in me first I might be an example to all those who come by. Paul was the Paul was the worst. He was taking families that just received Jesus, throwing them in prison. He said some of his uh, prison ease that he threw in there led to their death. Paul said, I was first to be an example. So the guy we talked about earlier, well, I would have to say, well, the Apostle Paul is worse than you. And he said, I'm the example, Paul. So we'd have to tell him, man, Paul said he was an example for you, people, and me. You got your Luke 24, 27? Let's go. 
And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. This is Jesus. He rose up from the dead. The disciples are walking on the uh, road to Emmaus. They don't know that it's him. Some you know people argue how they didn't know it was him. Who cares? They didn't know it was him. And so he could block their sight or look different or whatever. Who, it doesn't say. So he doesn't know. So a stranger walks up. Hey, guys, what's going on? Like, what? Where have you been, dummy? Like. What do you mean? Jesus of Nazareth crucified of the whole big shindig? I'm like, what are you, a dummy? And then he expounded all the scriptures, pointed to himself. Then he was about to leave and they said, hey, you come with us. And he broke bread and he disappeared out of his sight. Man, that's so cool. Maybe you don't know that story. You'd like to hear it. Uh, some, some people are fresh to the Bible. And so I don't want to take it for granted. So he's walking out. This is after he rose from the dead. The disciples don't really have it come to grips yet that he's rose from the dead. So here's this stranger who they can't believe doesn't know what's going on. He explains the whole scripture of the Old Testament pointed to him, Jesus, and what he just did. And they're just like, what? And then so at that moment, they got to this little split in the road and he and it said Jesus would have went this way. They would have went that way. They said, hey, please stay with us and eat with us. And so they went to eat. Uh, he said, OK. Isn't that cool? What? <laughs> like. How much of life? You know, anyway, so he said, I'll stay. And he stays and they asked him to break bread. And they said, as soon as he broke bread, their eyes were open. It was either the way he broke bread or how he did it or whatever he was going to do. Their eyes were open that moment to see him and he disappeared. That's fun. Jesus is fun. I'm glad I got a cool book. I ain't following some dead thing. Man, I, for some reason, I, I've been watching, I've watched for the first time in my life, three or four Jewish services. Because I thought, you know, that's where we come from, the Jewish thing. I, that's how y'all have church? <laughs> Ow! We're supposed to be making them jealous with the spirit, with life. We're lively. We are loving God. You're so dead. You're so dis you're so distant from him. I see you so distant from him. You're calling on him so far away and then you're so far in your mind and your heart. Your faith is not some mystery faith where you're living with Jesus living inside of you through you. Not yet. Not I, but him who lives inside. You ain't got none of that. I mean, I know the Muslims got that mess. You know, just got nothing. I, I, when I was in Bible college, they took me to, um, um, I, got, I, I joined this cult class so that they would take me to all the cults. And I got to go to Muslims and um, uh, Jehovah Witness and um, Mormons and um, Sikhs. We were going to a snake handling church, but then they canceled on me. And I was, whew, I'm never going to get over that damn. Anyway. Um, man, I'm losing it. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't want to lose this. We got Jesus. He broke the bed. He's cool. Yeah, let's keep going. Give me Colossians 2.16, baby. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Listen to Paul tell you about the Old Testament. They were shadows. Okay, Don't let anybody judge you on those shadows. Like some people are like, oh, I'm keeping every day unto the Lord. Well, I'm keeping the Sabbath. Well, I'm not keeping the Sabbath. And then Paul was like, listen, y'all are fighting over the dumbest stuff over the shadows. None of that matters. Jesus right here, which are the things to come, but the body is of Christ. Well, if you, yeah, the one before that. Let me keep moving with Matthew 12, 40. Here's what I want you to see. When Jesus said that the whole Bible points to him, he's the object. We have these shadows. I want to show you. Uh, I got. It looks like six scriptures and we're done with the scriptures. Listen to these shadows, because what 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 I'm trying to get out of these shadows before we leave right quick is a glimpse of mystery faith like we were looking at with Cain and Abel trying to pull some mystery faith, shadow teaching. Here's some examples of Jesus being the object of the shadow. 
For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus in this teaching moment is using himself. He's the object and he's the, the shadow that's cast was the story of Jonah. We learned that as a kid. They really want to take that story away from us. It's not going to happen. He was swallowed by a big fish. I didn't even say a whale. It says big fish. Jesus is uh, the person, the object of that shadow of Jonah in his death, burial, and resurrection. Give me this one in John three fourteen. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So here's Jesus just showing you, hey, when um, the snakes came out and bit the people because they were murmuring and stuff against God, God said, put a snake up on a pole and everyone who looks at it. Jesus is using this shadow right here Watch this. He's using this shadow to show them that faith. It's a picture where like Jesus is going to be put up on the cross. He's going to be the one when you look at him and your snake bites and your sin. Uh, you see, it's, it's a, you're able to get the, through the shadow of faith. Yeah, let's try it. Give me the last one, an example. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The manna in the wilderness. What a beautiful story. Awesome. You couldn't, you couldn't pick up more than a day's worth. You had to pick it. God said, just go get your daily bread. Go get exactly what you need. Don't get any more. Don't get any less. It's exactly that. Just get it. And if you kept it overnight, it turned into worms. So God doesn't want you living off of yesterday's prayer. It's, da it's daily prayer. So look at, see the picture, the picture in the, the picture of faith in the shadow. Uh, right there in the manna. That's a way we can look at Jesus. Right there is the bronze serpent. See, see that faith, that looking at the cross, that, that, that's a picture in the Old Testament of how you would, uh, of looking, of how, look, what, looking at the cross, how Abel was looking at his sacrifice. And, um, and then so you got the bronze and then you got Jonah, you know, just anyway. So let's go to keep moving because we only got three more scriptures and we'll be done. Give me 1 Corinthians 10. So here's the last shadow I want us to look at. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses. Stop for a second. This is Paul, and he's teaching us about the Old Testament, and, he, and he's pulling from it the shadow the, that God's going to use for our faith. Go. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that there followed them, and that rock was Christ. But... With most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. These are our examples. So this example was supposed to help us believe not like they were believed. It's to help our faith. Everything's about what you believe, because whatever you believe is going to produce whatever you put on the altar. So... Um, these are examples. We back up to maybe four it was. No, 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 it wasn't. It was way back there. I just, it stopped me when he said that their bodies were scattered because uh, they didn't please him. And God said in our gospel, I've put the thing inside of you that will please me. Give it to me. Give me the thing I'm demanding out of you. I've given it to you. Here, Adam and Eve, I've given you innocent blood to cover you. Now give me that. You can't just like, oh, well, I'm going to just get, give God the thing he's demanding. Out of our mystery faith, he's demanding the thing inside of us to come out of us. Give me that. Give me my son inside of you. This rock is um, what I wanted to look at. Oh, let's go in the Old Testament. Let's read about this rock. Jesus, the, Paul told us right here that the shadow, this teaching in the Old Testament of this rock that they got water from, is a shadow for us, and that shadow is of Christ, which we've already said uh, is the object of the shadows. Now let's go read 
uh, about this rock and this pull from in our last lesson on seeing if we can, in our mystery faith, we use this rock to, to learn more about what, what do we mean by looking at the cross? Like the serpent that's raised up, that's, that's a help. Abel wasn't that much of a help, apparently. And this one might be uh, more of a help. But let's, let's read it. Exodus 17, 1 through 7. Uh, we're talking about the rock in the wilderness that, that's uh, our shadow. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you have brought us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So, um, the people of God need a provision they're in a desert. They got no water. They got cattle. They're wondering, why did you bring me out in the desert to kill me? Of course, they're complaining. They got zero faith. So um, here's how God is creating shadow after shadow after shadow after shadow because Jesus said the whole book is written about me. Shadow after shadow after shadow, showing us Jesus, showing us Jesus, getting us ready for a Savior, getting us ready for a Savior, getting us ready for a Savior. And then so... Um, we, we have God who says, OK, here's one of the pictures. I want you to go out to the people and I want you to hit this rock with your staff. That is a picture of Jesus on the cross being crucified. OK. All right. So go to the next story in Numbers. This is some people say 40 years later. Right. Um, let's just read the Bible. Let the Bible speak. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from the Lord, and as he commanded, as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water from out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation, their animals, drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me, to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given you. God was creating a picture out of that rock. Moses is ruining the picture. God said, strike the rock, which is Jesus being crucified. And then what would happen, according to the gospel, is that then, as you have received Christ, so walk ye in him. So now God wanted to show you the rock only gets struck once, but then you come back and you just speak to the rock. It's just faith. God wanted the picture to be Jesus will be struck on the cross and then from that point forward he don't need to be crucified afresh for any reason then you come back by faith you just speak to the rock and it'll give you water it don't ever need to be hit again Moses hit it ruined it 
He didn't even get to go in the promised land. It must have been a big deal. Because that was his whole purpose in life, was to take them into the promised land. And in this one moment, striking that rock out of anger, instead of doing what God said by speaking to it, there's this picture there in the shadow. That's what we do. We know that the rock has been struck, and then our faith, as we're looking at the cross, it's just water comes in the desert through a rock. God wanted me to know that provision comes by me looking at the rock that was struck, and I just speak to the rock that was struck already. No? So, as we just keep pounding this over, Jesus, of course, is going to be on the cross, and that's where he's struck. And then from that point forward now, our believing in our heart, thank you, and our confessing with our mouth, and he just brought the whole sermon around. This, that's the end of the sermon. That was your last scripture, wasn't it? Um, Believing in our heart, confessing with our mouth. Yay. That's our new stir. Speaking to the rock, believing in our heart, confessing with our mouth. Put that together. The new stir of believing in our heart, confessing with our mouth, putting with the shadow faith for our mystery, is that now we just speak. Like at the rock, towards the rock, the rock that was struck, the acknowledging of the struck rock. You know, Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the rock. And so by doing this, um, this is our uh, sermon, basically. Is I wanted to keep ironing out... Um, Somebody who wants to know what they're looking at. Everything. Think about the miracle of that rock. Like, what are you looking at? Like, God just said, speak to the rock. Just go speak to the rock. The last thing we ever do is believe in our heart and confess. But that's the picture for us. The rock has been struck. Now go speak. And water in a desert place will flow forth. You can feed your animals. God, please keep showing us how to look at you through the sacrifice, to have the faith that causes us to be right Christians. You know, there's a special faith that we're supposed to have that stirs up the gift inside of us. So we need to learn some of these stirring uh, maneuvers. There's something about calling on the Lord. Oh Lord Jesus, be one with me as I go to Kroger and get some, you know, a candy bar. Just in the car, just talking to him. You're just one with him. You're not just like these people who God's over there. He's, I mean, he basically, he stays inside of you without sleeping. I mean, he's just like, he's the roommate that's always there. So what I want you to do is, I want you to hear the Bible says, you can stir up the spirit by doing some of these spiritual things. And that's just calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. That's calling on Abba Father. Um, just remembering him. Speaking to the rock. You're just stirring up spiritual things. This would be your life doing that. God starts in the inside. And if you start stirring up things in your life, from the inside out, everything will just begin to change. That's where God works, from the inside out. People will just refuse to let God live in their heart and they want God to fix that thing and fix this thing and fix that thing. And God's like, that ain't how I work. Go to the doctor if that's how you want to. God starts in here. You can start in here and then go to the doctor.
Paul, uh, Paul, God told Moses that it's because it said, because you didn't believe in me. When Moses was getting in trouble by God. See, what Moses did came from what he believed. So God sees difference in Christians' faith. I'm not trying to be mean about it. I'm trying to help you. God sees difference. You can't just live for the Lord thinking that you're getting his stuff. No, your faith is supposed to be in the deposit that he gave you. Then you stir it up through that obedience. That's the obedience of faith that you have. The obedience of faith that you have is to stir up the gift that's in you and let it come out and change everything. And any other faith is Cain. So a full gospel will take you all the way from being saved to getting the power into some sonship. That's just a little cheap plug. So it's not good enough just to believe things. I wanted to tell you this happened to me this week. Um, I'm, I, I, I'm always... Um, so personalized to me where I am in my personal relationship with God and I haven't always been here but I'm here now I just talk to my father during the day you know and, and I, you know I yes and so um, I thank him for um, the health that I need to make it to do all the days of my life. I thank him for all this. I just, I just acknowledge and remember all the abundance that I have for me to do all the things that I'm going to do. But then I, I do that. I do that quite often, a lot. And, but this week, for no reason, I'm just sitting in my office and, and I just decided, I just took my hand and I said, in the name of Jesus, I command you, you are disease free. You have no sick. I just like, I already believe that. You know what I'm saying? I always, I'm all, I'm, I'm believe, I always believe that and I say it out loud and I confess it and I believe it in my heart and I confess it. But I put my hand on myself and I started, I did it this way. Body, I command you to be healed from any disease and sickness and you don't have any cancer or, you know, just, just whatever I did. Something significantly expelled, left my body. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> You know, just like, how the heck did you slip? You know, just like, you have to practice what you preach. You, you know, if God just tells everybody he saves and heals, then there's just sick people in hell because you didn't know how to access it. Church tell you all day God will heal, but he won't tell you how to get it. I just wanted to point that out that, you know, believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth, mystery faith is pulling the deposit from you. I think the peace that Jesus spoke to the storm came out of his body. The peace that he would have had. Because he had the Holy Ghost. He's our example. Everything Jesus did was draw out from himself because he got the Holy Ghost. He laid him whole, his whole self aside in heaven so that he could come down here and be selfless, completely selfless, drawing from the Holy Ghost, showing us how it's done. Just looking us all in the face. Are you, can you not see me? Can you not see what I'm doing? This is, this is how you do it. I'm, everything that came out of all of his answers, all of his miracles, everything he was just drawing, not from himself. He set aside that part of himself. All, that's our job. To draw, 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 draw with the example of Jesus. Go so far as like lay your hands on. You see what I mean? You can't let six months go by without doing that. You just need to practice the Bible. What if you just incorporated this in your life like you do any other little thing? Why has it got to be a big deal? Why does this have to be anything different? Why can't this be a habit? Why can't this be a good habit they teach kids in school? Oh, that's right. Because the God of this world is the devil. But God said, I don't need to worry about that. I put something inside of you because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So forget them cats. Okay.
Okay, well. I'm going to say it. One thing I want you to know about your spirit is you can feel something in your spirit. That's interesting. And your mind will talk you out of it. Your mind vetoes your spirit all the time. Well, where are you going to get the money for that? Where are you going to, you know, like, you can't, you don't have that, you don't have the education. You know, like, what? Well, you can't go to school. That's what I've heard in my mind. <laughs> Because your spirit has, you need to stir your spirit up to get strong because the Holy Spirit will never leave you wrong. Never, never, never leave you wrong and lead you into brighter, brighter places. Just if you could get to a place where you have stirred your spirit up so much doing these spiritual things that, well, really, you, you, there's, all doubt is being eliminated. Practice this kind of faith. It's mystery faith. And then your mind can't sabotage and veto your spirit. Because that's what happens in our bodies. That's why it's important that everything's coming out of our spirit. God deals only in our spirits. He's in our spirit. He speaks from our spirit. He releases life from our spirit into our bodies. So I even want you to go and release from your spirit into your body. And into any situation. Just walk into a, a domestic dispute, Jordan, and just say, you just walk into a domestic dispute and you just have the peace that's inside of your body. Say, man, I heard this crazy sermon. And you just come in and you just say, peace in this room right here. And all of a sudden he's fighting people just. You're like, what? Yeah, that's what Jesus did. And he said, if they're worthy, let your peace stay. And if it's not, then take it with you. Don't worry about that. I'll get you in trouble. What's the gift inside of you? The Holy Ghost. So we're stirring him up, doing these things, calling on the name of the Lord, uh, believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth, just things you remember about the Lord, just the scripture. Just do these things right here that look so uh, ordinary, but they're not. These are the things that were designed by God, created by him for you to do to stir up your spirit that he gave you, that he put all things in. Woo. Or you can go back to religion where you're just praying. Been there, done that. I have this one more point and it's just like it'd be so dumb not to say this one last point because I have worked I think that's what I was telling Sean a minute ago when he was telling that uh, deliverance story and I thought man I just want y'all to know God's in that business hundreds of times I've seen that hundreds of times because I've, I've laid hands I know a thousand people I, I, I my ministry has not been this filling up this building it's been meeting these people all from everywhere and praying for them I mean, I, I can't even even remember them all. There's and stories, demons and healings and oh my God, that's been my thing. You know, it's just like and, and so you wouldn't know that by just coming and sitting here. You wouldn't know how many people God's brought up this hill that that uh, I'd meet years later. Oh my God, that changed my life. You put me in that chair. They call them the blue chairs. Um, what I learned about people trying to help that many people. They all won't help. To a certain point. Yep. Every single one of them. Here and no further. But I do need you to bring it here. And no further. Well then you, you, you don't get to do that. I've seen that be the downfall of most all the people. People will come here and get their life radically changed, changed, changed. And they get everybody gets to this one spot. And they you ain't coming here. I'll do all this stuff with y'all. But I'm not going there. But the whole point of the gospel is transformation on assignment. You have to be transformed for level, level. You're going to another level, you. And you reason, Erebush, Enemashe, Enebeokaya, 
And the reason you're at this level, because God increased you and made you ready. And, you, and you'll be increased from here to go to your next level because that's what God does. I don't know why he just said that to you, but you can have that. Whatever that is, this is how this works. People, the gospel is telling you to draw from the deposit and people just stop. And so I look at all the Christians and you and, and if I had a chart, you can see where they all stop. Everybody just, um, you know, how many of us called on the name of the Lord last week? You see what I mean? And uh, so I guess I, that was, I should ask any other church, uh, but. Let me show you this, Sean. Put up Deuteronomy 28.1. Behold, I lay before you blessing and curses. Choose this day, life or death. That's what Joshua was saying. Do you know that that's not my choice? Because that's a different faith. A different faith with a different choice. To choose life or death, that's a dead man who didn't have the spirit to draw from. So his choice between life and death was the Torah and practicing the Torah to please God. That was his choice. Between these curses and blessings, you doing what God has demanded of you. You choosing to do what God's demanded. I've laid before you, I've demanded you do this and demanded you not do that. Now you choose what you're going to do. That's not my choice. If you're going to divide the Bible, you better divide the Bible. Do you know where my choice comes in between life and death, cursing and blessing? Is in Romans 8, when I choose in my mind to either draw life from my inside or I draw life from my intellect where I've stored 20 professional uh, know-it-alls who knows everything by I can't do what I'm trying to do, where I've stored that up there. My choice in life as a Christian, whether I'm seeing life or death in my life, is not because I'm in Deuteronomy choosing between, you know, doing all. No, it's because I'm not choosing the life that's in me manifesting and coming out and, and going past the point where I want you to stop. No, you don't get to stop. You keep going, and that's where life comes from. And when you choose otherwise, that's where death comes from. That's our choice. Our choice is life or death through the deposit. You know what I'm talking about? When you stop, that, that's where death comes from. When your mind starts saying, well, I'm walking this way, I'll, walk, I'll do that, yeah. It's good. My choice between life or death is whether I'm going to draw out of my well or not. And if I don't, I'm stuck with everything we all got here and it's all death and rottenness. I'm tired of boring you. That's fun to say. I don't, I don't need any more. I, that was it. Sorry, it wasn't even. I, yeah, it was, it was just Deuteronomy. I thought it was 28, verse 1. Maybe. maybe. Is it? Go to 28, verse 1, just so I can see my err. Oh, you know where I'm from now. You know what I mean? I don't see my err. Well, I got it now. Wow, it's a long chapter. Wow. Come on now. It's so, whoa. Voice of the Lord, sir, all the bells 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 of the Lord, Okay, well, I guess I know that right. Well, bless, yeah, bless, bless, Lord. Yep, 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 yep. Yep. No, it's Deuteronomy 28, verse 1. Let me look at 30. Where were you at? 30 who? Maybe a repeat.
Oh yeah, okay. Well, no, I guess I do need 28 because this is where he attaches all the uh, fine print. And it shall come to pass if you... Now look, God's giving his demand to the people that he wants back from them so they need to believe what he's saying so he, they can give it back to him. And it shall come to pass that if you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe... And to do all his commandments, which I have commanded thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. Oh, can we keep going? I got it right here. Uh, and all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, blessed shall be thy in the city, blessed shall be in the field, blessed the fruit of thy body, blessed the ground, and blessed is your cattle, blessed is everything. You're all blessed. Or, it says over here, but if you will not hearken to the Lord, curse shall be this, curse is that, curse, 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 curse. Hearkening to the voice of the Lord. Well, the voice of the Lord to us is different than the voice of the Lord to them because God came down from heaven to tell us our gospel. And our voice to us is uh, if we want to be blessed in the cattle and the field and we want to have no curses, then we've got to live like God said and give him what he demands from us, which is the deposit inside of us that wasn't inside of them. My choice of life and death is that in the gospel. People just do whatever they want. And your life shows it. It's death. When you see death, you need to back up and get off the off ramp. Okay. And God said, you know what he told Cain? This is my favorite. This is my last thing I'll say. It's my favorite thing. I always say that. Everything in the Bible is my favorite thing. So um, Cain was mad, God said, Cain, all you got to do is just give me what I asked you. You could ask anybody who's all up in a mess, all you have to do is give me what I've asked you. But I, 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 just give me what I asked you. He said, go back to your tent. There's sin tied up there. It's crouching at the door. That If you read it and write in the Hebrew, it's a sin offering. God put a sin offering there at the tent so he could say, hey, Cain, just go back and get it and bring it back to me and everything will be fine. Give me what I've asked you for and I've even provided it for you. King like, mm. I think his anger just caused him to not be able to, you know, see straight. Because whatever he did, he went and killed his brother for it. All he had to do is go back to his tent and give the thing. That's what God says. I, I just want you, listen, you're down in the dumps, you're stuck on crack. All I want you to do is give me what I've asked for. You're like, what? I ain't going to go to church and do the Ten Commandments. I mean, I ain't, I'm, not, I'm not perfect. Enough. No, dummy. I've put all of it inside of you. Give it out. Let it out of you. Let it start changing your mind. Let it start changing your behavior. Let it start making you holy. Let it start causing you to be like Jesus. Let it cause you to love people. Nope, I said I was done. Cain. Boy, I mean, if he's up there, man, he's like the butt of all the jokes down here. He could be in heaven for all I know. Paul said he was an example. He was worse than Cain. But he didn't have our gospel, though, did he? That's tricky. Now, I'll leave all that up to the big man. I'm going to stay right where I'm supposed to be in the stuff that was revealed to me. Lord Jesus, we just continue to listen to your word of instruction as you lead our feet into greener, greener pastures and still waters because you are a God of increase of brighter and brighter and brighter days and the righteous have brighter and brighter days until the final day when we get to see you unveiled for the first time in our new bodies. Yay! God, we got to have the faith that draws out the deposit or we're just sitting here talking about junk. God, I don't know if you know what metaphysics is or not, but metaphysics is when you... <laughs> it's when you just sit there and you just envision a thing. Envision yourself healed. 
That's all we would be doing if we don't access this. We're just talking about the greatness of God, envisioning it in our life and imagining ourselves what we're saying. <laughs> man, I ain't going to be that guy, man. That metaphys, whatever. God, I'm asking raw deal, Bill Holyfield, if we would, I mean, we want to touch the thing. My faith is my substance of the thing I hope for. Help us be the best at this. In Jesus' name, amen.